Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Uh, this, it may not surprise people when I get to the end of this sentence, but I have been thinking a lot lately about my maternal grandmother who grew up during the Great Depression. Uh, after that, she went on to raise five children while also working full-time at the mom-and-pop furniture store that she and my grandfather started together. Uh, and before before that really got off the ground, she had also graduated from college in 1939 with a degree in home economics. By the time I was in high school, a lot of school systems were phasing out their home ec classes, and by that point, those classes a lot of the time focused mostly on the basics of things like cooking and sewing. But home economics as a field was a lot broader than that, and for a time, the U.S. Department of Agriculture had a whole bureau of home economics, which was run pretty much by and for women, and was also a huge part of the response to crises like the Great Depression and World War II. So, thinking about my grandmother led me to this episode. So, we're going to start by uh, talking about the development of home economics as a field. People who do domestic work, whether in their own home or someone else's, have always had to learn how to do it. But before the middle of the 19th century in the United States, almost all of that learning was informal. It was just handed down from person to person, usually from one woman to another, possibly supplemented with things like books and magazines. In general, education for women and girls was limited and often most accessible to white, relatively affluent students. So one of the first people to start thinking about homemaking and domestic work as a formal course of study was Catherine Beecher. She was the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Beecher was a proponent of education for women, and she also thought that a woman's fear was the home. So a lot of her educational ideas were really focused on teaching women domestic skills. She started implementing her Beecher plan to that end at Milwaukee Normal Institute and High School, which was founded in 1851. More home economics courses came along in the 1860s in conjunction with the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862, or an act donating public lands to the several states and territories which may provide colleges for the benefit of agriculture and the mechanic arts. This act granted land to the states, with the amount of land based on how many seats the state had in Congress. The states then sold the land and used the proceeds either to fund new colleges or to fund the creation of agriculture and mechanics schools at existing colleges. The first formalized home economics programs got their start at land-grant colleges, including Iowa State College, Kansas State Agricultural College, and Illinois Industrial University. Today, those are now Iowa State University, Kansas State University, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. These programs described what they were teaching using several different names, including home ecology, human sciences, and practical life sciences, in addition to home economics. Some private women's colleges, including Wellesley, also dabbled with the idea of home economics programs. But that idea didn't really take off within the realm of private education. In general, the private women's colleges that were established in the 19th century were focused on giving women access to the same education that men had, not on teaching women what was already thought of as women's work. The person who started pulling all of these disparate home economics programs into a more cohesive movement was Ellen Swallow Richards. Richards was the first woman to be admitted at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which was a land-grant school, She also became one of the first women to work as a professional chemist in the United States. Richard's time at MIT followed a similar trajectory to other women that we've talked about on the show. She completed PhD coursework, but was not granted that degree because MIT did not award doctoral degrees to women. Because of her gender, her first years teaching chemistry were unpaid. But she also focused on opening doors for women at MIT, including advocating for the establishment of its Woman's Laboratory, which was funded by the Women's Education Association of Boston in 1876. Most of Richard's work as a chemist was focused on water quality, but she also studied the chemistry of homemaking. 
1890, she oversaw the establishment of the New England Kitchen, which provided food to low-income families while also offering instruction in food preparation and food safety. And they also conducted scientific research into cooking and nutrition. In 1891, she published The Chemistry of Cooking and Cleaning, a manual for housekeepers, and she did demonstrations of these concepts at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. In 1899, Richards convened a summer conference at the Lake Placid Club in New York to discuss the latest advancements in the field and where it was going. Eleven people attended the conference in its first year, and they agreed to standardize the name of the field as home economics. The annual Lake Placid conferences grew over the next decade, and the conference hung on to that Lake Placid name even when the meeting itself took place somewhere else. In 1902, attendees agreed on this definition of home economics. One, home economics in its most comprehensive sense is the study of laws, conditions, principles, and ideals, which are concerned on the one hand with man's immediate physical environment, and on the other hand with his nature as a social being, and is the study specifically of the relation between those two factors. Two, in a narrow sense, the term is given to the study of the empirical sciences with special reference to the practical problems of housework, cooking, etc. More than 700 people attended the final Lake Placid Conference in 1908. That year, attendees established the American Home Economics Association, and Richards served as its first president. The following year, she established the Journal of Home Economics and provided its initial funding. Some of the other people who were heavily involved in the early years of the home economics movement included Melville Dewey, who developed the Dewey Decimal System, and his wife, Annie. In the early 20th century, attendees of the Lake Placid conferences actually lobbied very hard, but unsuccessfully, to change how home economics was classified within the Dewey Decimal System. They tried to move material that was more related to economics and sociology under 300 sociology instead of 600 useful arts. Uh, Basically, sociology was a more prestigious number. Today, those Dewey Decimal classes are social sciences and technology. Two other important figures were Martha Van Rensselaer and Flora Rose, who were the first two women to become full professors at Cornell in 1911. They served as co-directors of Cornell's newly established home economics department, which eventually became its own school. Rose and Van Rensselaer were partners at work and at home for more than 20 years, and they were described as inseparable until Van Rensselaer's death in 1932. Together, they were affectionately named Miss Van Rose, and they advocated for home economics programs across the U.S. in addition to their work at Cornell. Home economics programs got another boost with the Smith-Lever Act of 1914. This established the Cooperative Extension Service to provide outreach services, especially to rural communities, through the land-grant colleges. There were also more land-grant colleges by this point, thanks to a second Morrill Act passed in 1890. That established funding for schools for Black students in the South. Uh, The first Morrill Act back in 1862 had allowed states with segregated education systems to establish schools for Black students, but almost none of them had done so. Within a year of the Smith-Lever Act being passed, there were more than 1,800 extension workers in the U.S. who conducted lectures, demonstrations, and classes through cooperative extension programs. In 1917 alone, more than 27,000 women took home economics classes through cooperative extension services. That year, the Smith-Hughes Act also established funding for teachers for industrial, agricultural, and home economics courses. A year later, home economics programs were actively involved in relief efforts during the 1918 flu pandemic. Home economists and home ex students cooked meals for the sick and for healthcare workers. They sewed masks and gowns for medical personnel, and they assisted with patient care. Some colleges converted their home economics schools, which were already equipped with kitchens and other necessary facilities, into field hospitals. 
By this point, the field of home economics was well-established, with people, mostly women, learning domestic skills through classes taught in public schools, colleges, and universities, and cooperative extension programs. Home economists were also involved with public health policy, community outreach, and advocacy. The field also had a lot of crossover with other progressive era movements, including labor activism, the settlement house movement, and the women's suffrage movement. The field of home economics also involved a lot of research. Home economists studied subjects like food science, nutrition, textile science, child development, and design. They evaluated newly introduced consumer products and services, and they were really instrumental in public acceptance of some of these new products, including things like prepackaged canned and frozen foods. All of this research folded back into the field's practical instruction arm. As schools established graduate programs in home economics, people with those degrees were also hired to direct public health and school nutrition programs, as well as food programs during times of hardship. Women with home economics degrees also went on to work in hotel and restaurant management, interior design, and other related fields. So the field of home economics recognized that the work women were expected to do to run a home was work, and that there was a huge amount of it. As a field, it was dedicated to studying that work and its outcomes and to finding solutions to problems to try to make that work easier, which would improve the quality of life for homemakers and their families and, by extension, society as a whole. So among its advocates, the field of home economics gave women access to education that they would not have otherwise and tools that they could use to make their own lives better and their work easier and more effective. But critics argued that the existence of these programs was just reinforcing the expectation that the only thing women could or should do was to become homemakers. There have been other criticisms as well. Even as colleges and universities for Black students established home economics programs, the most vocal and visible people in the field and the people hired to lead government programs continued to be predominantly white. Because the field was so focused on what was thought of as women's sphere, some of its proponents were opposed to various equal rights measures for women, including the right to vote. Many college programs in home economics included practice houses or practice apartments where students lived together to get practical experience in domestic skills. Many of these programs also had practice babies that were on loan from local orphanages, and these babies were basically cared for by a rotating assortment of students. I may be doing an episode on this soon, (laughs) depending on where the research takes me. The home economics movement also had some overlap with the earlier years of the eugenics movement and things like better baby contests. One of the early names for the field was even eugenics, or better living, which was coined as a companion to Sir Francis Galton's term eugenics, or better breeding. We have a prior episode on the eugenics movement in the archive for folks who want more information on that. All that said, for a time, offices and programs within the federal government also recognized the massive amount of labor involved with homemaking and how critical it was to the nation. And they took steps to help. We're going to talk more about that after a sponsor break. The U.S. Department of Agriculture was established in 1862. And by the start of the 20th century, it had various programs and offices that were related to the field of home economics in one way or another. Then in 1915, the Office of Home Economics was formally established as part of the state's relations service. Those existing programs that had been kind of spread through the USDA were consolidated under the newly established office, and that office started up new projects as well. In the words of various appropriations bills, the office would allow the Department of Agriculture to, quote, investigate the relative utility and economy of agricultural products for food, clothing, and other uses in the home, with special suggestions of plans and methods for more effective utilization of such products for these purposes, and to disseminate useful information on the subject. So it was a department that did a lot of outreach and created educational programs and materials, as well as doing a lot of research, including analyzing data that was being gathered by other departments. 
A lot of this research was about food, its digestibility and its nutrients, including analyzing vitamin content. Uh, Vitamins at that point were still a really new discovery. The office managed studies that used a respiration calorimeter to assess the caloric content of different foods. All of this led to the nation's first government nutrition guidelines. And this was not just about how much food it took to sustain a person, but also about how much money a family needed to be spending on food and how to prevent food waste. Experiments in a test kitchen looked at questions like the best ways to knead bread, how to conserve fuel in stoves and ovens, how to get bigger yields in homemade jellies. Researchers studied various methods of home canning to figure out how to preserve food safely while maintaining its quality. Other projects involved studying different fats and frying methods to reduce the waste of oil. The Office of Home Economics also surveyed women about the problems they faced in their lives and what the office might do to help them. For example, a 1915 survey on the domestic needs of farm women revealed that women living on farms had concerns about pest management and efficient kitchen design and fashionable dresses. The women who were surveyed talked about really wanting clothes that they felt good about wearing and that were easy enough to make that they could get it right the first time without wasting fabric on do-overs. So the Department of Home Economics started drafting functional, attractive dress patterns They had a lot of features like having three-quarter length sleeves so that you were less likely to get your sleeve caught in the cooking fire, like that kind of a mindset. They also made patterns for women's work clothes, since the surveys also revealed that farm women did not like having to work in their husband's altered cast-offs. The Office of Home Economics also published material for educational programs. For example, a 1917 bulletin by Louise Stanley outlined all the topics that should be covered in a complete first-year home economics course. They were food, selection, both in homegrown and purchased food, as well as food preparation and planning and serving meals. Shelter, including home sanitation, planning, decoration, furnishing, and care. Clothing, including selection, making, keeping in good repair, and laundry. Care and training of children, including infant care, addressing problems in young children, and amusement for children. Hygiene and sanitation, including knowledge of diseases and ways to preserve health. Caring for the sick at home. Household management, including budgeting. And training for the enjoyment of leisure time. I like the idea that that sort of reads as though Uh, you've got so much to do that you might need a little help figuring out how to enjoy it when you have leisure time. In 1922, the Association of Land-Grant Colleges started advocating for the Department of Home Economics to become its own full-fledged bureau. Congress authorized the creation of the Bureau of Home Economics on July 1st of 1923, The chief of this newly created bureau was Dr. Louise Stanley, author of that bulletin that we just mentioned. Stanley was the third woman to head a federal bureau and the first to head one that was considered major. The two that were ahead of her were Grace Abbott, who was chief of the Children's Bureau of the Department of Labor, and Mary Anderson, who was chief of the department's Women's Bureau. Stanley had earned a Ph.D. in chemistry from Yale in 1911, and she had served as professor and chair of home economics at the University of Missouri before joining the FDA in 1914. For most of the 1920s, she made her home in Washington, D.C., with Annabelle Matthews, a solicitor with the Department of the Treasury. Mabel Walker Willebrandt and her adopted daughter Dorothy joined the household in the mid-20s, and when she and her daughter moved to Georgetown in 1929, Stanley adopted a baby girl named Nancy, who had previously been a practice baby. The news article about that is how I learned about practice babies and almost abandoned this entire episode to just focus (laughs) on that. Uh, But I did (laughs) did not have time to be changing the horse in the middle of that stream. When the Bureau of Home Economics was first established, it had a budget of $72,000 and a staff of about five people. Stanley's salary was about $5,000, and that made her the highest paid woman in the federal government at that time. By the 1930s, the Bureau had grown to a staff of 71 and a budget of more than $168,000. The main areas of focus for the Bureau of Home Economics were food and nutrition, textiles and clothing, and the economics of the home. 
The respiration calorimeter was transferred to the Bureau of Animal Industry, but the Bureau of Home Economics still did a lot of research into vitamins, diet, the nutritional content of foods, and food preparation and storage methods. This included research into using diet to treat and prevent pellagra, which is caused by a niacin deficiency and was widespread in the South. The Bureau of Home Economics built on a lot of the research that the Office of Home Economics had previously been doing. Studies in food and nutrition, including cooking times and temperatures, storage temperatures, and shelf life, along with continuing to refine home canning practices. The Bureau also studied preparation methods for reindeer, which had been introduced into Alaska as a food source for Alaska natives over the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Bureau did similar work with rabbits during times when people were encouraged to raise rabbits as a food source, which included during World War II. As home refrigeration became more common in the 1940s, the Bureau used a microbiology lab to determine temperature ranges for safe refrigeration. When it came to textiles, there just had not been a lot of formal study into how to best care for different fabrics. The Bureau studied how to care for different fibers and how those fibers could most effectively be used. They also researched home laundering, things like water temperatures and the efficacy of different detergents, including how much soil was really removed and how the textiles themselves were affected. The Bureau also researched ironing, stain removal, and hygiene. The Bureau also continued to design and distribute patterns for clothing and household articles. They really focused on items that were sturdy and practical with easy construction and easy laundering. In children's clothing, they focused on durability, ease of care, and designs that allowed children to learn to dress themselves. When ready-to-wear garments became more widely popular and widely available, the Bureau shifted its focus away from home sewing and on to how to select and care for store-bought garments, as well as on advocating for standardized sizes and ready-to-wear clothing. The department's focus on the economics of the home came from a lot of directions. One aspect was how people were using their incomes. A lot of this research focused on food and clothing since those are the two major expenses in most households. The Bureau studied what people actually bought with the goal of matching production in the U.S. to what consumers were going to consume. The Bureau also studied mothers' pensions, which were payments to mothers of newborns to encourage them to stay home, which had been implemented in most states by the mid-1930s. The Bureau wanted to determine whether the payments really were enough to allow a new mother to stay at home. The Bureau also focused on the more intangible idea of homemakers' workloads, including asking women to keep really detailed records of their days. Hildegard Nieland was the head of the economics of the home team, and in her words from a publication called Is the Modern Housewife a Lady of Leisure, quote, Five-sixths of these homemakers spent over 42 hours a week in their homemaking. More than half spent over 48 hours, and one-third spent over 56 hours. The average for all is slightly over 51 hours a week. If this be part-time work, what, one may ask, would be full-time? This economic study wasn't just about documenting how much work it took to manage a home. The Bureau also researched time and labor-saving techniques to try to make the work involved in keeping a home more efficient. All of this research that the Bureau was doing informed a wealth of publications that were distributed through public schools, colleges, and extension programs, as well as home economics clubs. The Bureau's outreach also went straight to consumers through pamphlets, cookbooks, radio addresses, and other materials. In 1943, the Bureau of Home Economics became the Bureau of Human Nutrition and Home Economics. Hazel Catherine Stiebling became its chief in 1944. Like Louise Stanley, she had a Ph.D. in chemistry. The Bureau continued with its efforts to, quote, develop through research new knowledge about efficient household management and ways to make best consumer use of food, fiber, and other products of the country's farms. In the 1940s, this included research into the most efficient kitchen design, concluding that a U-shaped kitchen could allow enough space for two women to work while keeping cross-traffic from the rest of the house from getting in the way. As expectations and roles for women shifted in the 1960s, the federal government started to scale back the Bureau, and the Bureau of Human Nutrition and Home Economics was disbanded in 1962. 
Some of the research that had been going on continued through the USDA's Agricultural Research Service, and some of the same types of research in some areas do continue today, both through the Agricultural Research Service and through the Economic Research Service. The fields of home economics and home economics education were also changing. From its beginnings, home ec had been thought of as a subject for women, and in many public schools, girls automatically took home economics, while boys took shop or industrial arts. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 outlawed this type of discrimination, which led to questions about whether these classes were still legal if they were open to all, but if only girls enrolled. Of course, there are also other conversations about, like, what kinds of education were necessary and useful and what schools and school systems should be paying for, which is one of the reasons that by the time I came along, like, the home ec at school in a lot of places was not as big of a deal. In 1993, the American Home Economics Association became the American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences, And in places where these types of classes are still part of the curriculum and where college programs still exist, family and consumer sciences is the more common name. The Cooperative Extension Service that was such a big part of home economics education still exists. And family and consumer sciences continues on as this interdisciplinary field incorporating a lot of the same specializations that were previously thought of as part of home economics. We haven't really talked about the Bureau of Home Economics' role in times of crisis, which is a big reason behind doing this episode. And it also touches on some topics that we have gotten a lot of requests for lately. So we're going to get to all that, but first we'll take a quick sponsor break. The Office of Home Economics and the Bureau of Home Economics were both instrumental in helping American families cope during some hard times. The Office of Home Economics was already in place when the United States became involved in World War I, and the Bureau of Home Economics had programs that were meant to address the hardships that accompanied the Great Depression and World War II. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about them. During World War I, the Office of Home Economics was a huge part of food conservation programs in the United States. The overall goal was not just to make sure households were able to make do with what was available, but also to allow the United States to provide food support to its allies in the war. In the words of The Day's Food in War and Peace, the situation has become critical. There is not enough food in Europe, yet the soldiers of the allies must be maintained in full strength. Their wives and children at home must not face famine. The friendly neutrals must not be starved. And finally, our own army in France must never lack a needed ounce of food. There is just one way in which all these requirements can be met. North America must furnish the food. And we must furnish it from our savings because we have already sent our normal surplus. The Day's Food and War and Peace was published by the Department of Agriculture and the Women's Committee of the Council of National Defense. And it was created in part with the government's home economists. It was a teaching tool meant as a guide for things like club programs or community demonstrations. And it also directed women to their local universities' home economics departments, as well as the local branches of the American Home Economics Association for support. This publication really focused on reducing the use of wheat, meat, fat, and sugar, and strictly portioning other foods to eliminate food waste, but it also stressed not to hoard food. It also called for women's support in the food conservation effort, not just for the sake of their nation and their families, but also out of empathy for the women of Europe, especially France. It noted that most French women bought their bread from bakers and that if bakers didn't have the wheat they needed, even after making substitutions, French women had to turn to making porridges and cakes that weren't already part of their cooking repertoire, while also caring for the sick and wounded and living in constant wartime peril. Quote, not one slightest additional burden should be laid on the women of France. Far less should they be forced to add another hour to their long day of toil because we fail to send them wheat. The day's food in War and Peace includes a lot of recipes. There are victory breads, which were any breads that contained a wheat substitute in place of at least 25% of the wheat that was normally called for. Substitutes included barley flour, rolled oats, corn flour, and buckwheat. There are also quick breads made entirely from wheat substitutes and meatless recipes, including bean soups and stuffed cabbage. 
as well as sponge cakes that didn't require wheat or fat. This publication also includes information about the calorie content of different foods, as well as the calories needed to support an eight-hour workday in different occupations, depending on how strenuous those occupations were. There's also a cost breakdown based on the price of foods versus how many calories they provide. One of the later chapters encourages people to buy as much as they can locally and to research the farms and other resources in their own area. Throughout, it is full of information about how wheat, meat, fat, and sugar work in food and in the body and the why behind the directions to conserve them. The day's food in War and Peace was aimed at people who would be teaching this material to others. But the Office of Home Economics was also involved in informational pamphlets for consumers. These pamphlets included directions on how to prepare food in an economical way, how to make limited ingredients stretch, and how to prepare foods that might not have been pantry staples in other circumstances. Titles from this series included Make a Little Meat Go a Long Way, Instead of Meat, Vegetables for Winter, Save Sugar, Dried Peas and Beans, and Wheatless Bread and Cakes. The Office of Home Economics also contributed to thrift leaflets that were published in conjunction with the Savings Division of the Department of the Treasury. By the start of the Great Depression, the USDA had developed a character called Aunt Sammy, who was Uncle Sam's wife and who gave advice and answered women's questions. Aunt Sammy's Radio Recipes was a collection of recipes that had first come out through weekly housekeepers' chats that were aired through the radio. This became the first cookbook in the U.S. to be printed in Braille. From the start, the Aunt Sammy recipes were intended to be pretty economical, and during the Great Depression, the Department of Home Economics went even further with a series of publications about low-cost meal preparation and recipes. This included titles like Getting the Most for Your Food Money, The Family's Food at Low Cost, and a weekly newspaper column called Market Basket. Some of the advice in these publications was similar to what had been in The Day's Food and War and Peace when it came to conserving food, avoiding waste, and incorporating cheaper ingredients. But the Depression-era publications also included a lot more about incorporating canned and frozen foods, as well as enriched food products. The cost of many foods had dropped, but people also had less money. So along with tips about getting the most for your money, there were tips about using cuts of meat that some families had previously found too expensive, but were now priced lower than other alternatives. A lot of these Depression-era recipes were cheap and filling, and they were nutritionally complete based on the knowledge of the day, but they were not necessarily appetizing. In general, they tended to be both mushy and bland. For example, a low-cost menu from a 1933 edition of the Market Basket goes like this. Prunes and hot cereal or toast for breakfast, along with tomato juice for young children, milk for older children, and coffee for adults a dinner of mashed dried beans, stewed tomatoes, brown bread or graham muffins, and tea for adults with milk for children, and a supper of cottage cheese salad, bread and butter, cocoa, and canned fruit. I'm having a kitchen-related sad trombone in my head. (laughs) I mean, we've been eating a lot of dried beans (laughs) during the, the, the pandemic that we have been living through, but they have not been prepared in a mushy, bland way. No, I feel like um, because we're cooking at home all the time, we've kind of been eating like kings because I love a little kitchen experiment action and I love to invent things. So uh, some of this mushy blandness, though, that we're talking about was because of a belief that overly seasoned foods were too invigorating to the digestive system and would make people feel hungrier. As an aside, this breaks my heart. Uh, But there was probably some prejudice at work here as well. In general, the Bureau's recipe writers did not approve of spices that recent immigrants often relied on. During World War II, the Bureau of Home Economics again focused on food conservation, including cooking with rationed ingredients. I read a whole pamphlet that was about how much sugar you could get for canning with the ration system. It also published materials to help women process and store vegetables that were grown in victory gardens, although information about the gardens themselves typically came from other parts of the USDA and the War Food Administration. One aspect of this 
included a December 1943 radio broadcast reminding women that if they got canned vegetables or preserves as Christmas presents, they should carefully save those canning jars and lids for the following growing season. The Bureau also published material to help women who were entering the workforce during wartime. A 1942 publication called Work Clothes for Women listed these chapters in its table of contents. Know your job and dress for it. Field suit. Mechanic suit. Jumper slack suit. Protect all. Food preparation dress. Divided skirt dress. Belted overall apron. Surplus overall apron. Laboratory dress. Surplus house dress. Coverette. Princess overall apron. Nurse's uniform. Utility aprons. The Bureau also published patterns for these and other work garments for women. After the end of World War II, President Harry S. Truman established the President's Famine Emergency Committee to fight against world famine. The Bureau of Home Economics was ready with publications advising Americans again to cut back on wheat, fats, and oils to contribute to the overall aid effort. One pamphlet advised people to, quote, reach for a potato instead of bread, and offered suggestions for using potatoes, cornmeal, oatmeal, and other substitutes in place of bread. This particular publication also noted that people should conserve rice and not throw it at weddings. <laughs> and since this was all government-produced work, it is in the public domain today, and a lot of it is available online. If you Google Bureau of Home Economics Publications, you can go down a real rabbit hole. Patterns, here I come. <laughs> yeah, there, uh, there's patterns. There's also, uh, I mean, just so many different recipes, some of which I was curious to try, like various victory breads or quick breads that are including wheat substitutes. Um, like, I, I know some people have had a hard time getting wheat and yeast during the pandemic, and, like, I was very curious about trying some of those. Some of them I found a little more uh, questionable. Like, I found um, a broiled fish recipe that advised cooking the fish um, at a temperature of, like, 350 or something like that for, like, 20 minutes and then putting it on the, the broiler for another 15 more minutes. And I was like, nah, this does not sound like a good number of total minutes for some fish to me. I suspect, like, the broiler had to be less powerful than what we're used to. Has to be. Because you otherwise you're going to have fish jerky. Fish charcoal. <laughs> Do you have listener mail to go with this delightful adventure? I already found a pattern I'm going to make. Okay. <laughs> um, I have listener mail from Maggie. Maggie says, hello, Holly and Tracy. As one of perhaps many people who have written episode requests for anything beekeeping, when I opened today's podcast and saw a brief history of beekeeping, I think the neighbors could hear my shriek of delight. After eight years of being a beekeeper, member of our local hobby beekeepers association and editor of the newsletter, I know a bit about the subject, but you did not disappoint with new f and fun facts. I loved hearing about what Samuel Pepys had to say upon seeing an observation hive and, quote, the bees making their honey and combs mighty pleasantly. Your comments of agreement with his feelings were a surprise. I thought it was only nutty beekeepers who fell in love with their little charges. A while back, I had an MRI-type scan, and before going into the tube, the technician advised me to go to my happy place. When I emerged, I commented to her, I bet not a lot of people tell you their happy place is watching bees. She said, indeed, not. Maggie goes on to say that she doesn't have any hives this year and miss, misses the bees terribly, so thanks for that little buzz. And then in parentheses, beekeepers are a punny lot. Uh, Maggie also sent some pictures of uh, of a bear-proof apiary, um, which I looked at and I was like, I bet a bear, really determined bear, might still get through that. Um, and then also a, a, a donned outfit for um, treating uh, with some vapor to try to control varroa mites in the beehives. Um, so... This email ends with thanks again and stay out of those crowded hives, Maggie. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, I said in that episode, I really like bees. Um, lately, I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing, like I know a lot of other people have also. Uh, and when a friend of mine um, found the DIY recipe for beehives, she immediately made multiple beehives. 
and I sent her more wasp nests to make more beehives out of. So now I have like three beehives uh, on my Animal Crossing island. I've also been playing a lot of Assassin's Creed Odyssey where I very recently needed to go find a beehive out in the world. And I got really excited about that because I was like, okay, I just learned all these various things about beehives and beekeeping doing that that episode of the podcast. What beehive design is going to be in Assassin's Creed Odyssey? Um, the answer was, spoiler alert, stacked horizontal tube hives that were um, longer than I expected them to be, um, but still pretty cool. So anyway, thank you so much, Maggie, for this lovely email. We, we got it a couple of other emails about bees this morning, so um, beekeeping might make another appearance in future listener mail. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.